Well, good afternoon to everyone who's in North America. Uh, we're doing this webinar at a special time uh, because of our guest, our special guest, who is coming to us from Melbourne, Australia. Christina Garla is the uh, Marketing and Digital Strategy Manager for Epworth Healthcare uh, in Melbourne. She was one of the speakers at our uh, Mayo and Oz, hashtag Mayo and Oz, uh, Healthcare and Social Media Summit in Brisbane in early September. And we thought so much of what she had to share and thought it would be really great for uh, all of our colleagues uh, through the Mayo Clinic social media network to get a chance to hear it directly. So we're delighted to have uh, Christina joining us. It is now very early Wednesday morning, something like 7 o'clock Wednesday morning for her. So we appreciate her getting up uh, bright and early to uh, share with us. Uh, we look forward to the presentation. Uh, Christina, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Lee. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I, I'd just like to thank Lee for inviting me to do this webinar. It's, it's a really exciting opportunity. And also to thank his team for helping with the technical support. So thanks to Margaret, Dan and Sean. Um, I'm a little nervous about doing the webinar. It's my first one and um, I was speaking last night to my daughter about how different it is from getting up on stage and presenting. And, and she gave me some really solid advice. She said to me, you know, Mum, just do what the YouTubers do. Just look at that camera, be confident and have fun. So with that gorgeous advice in my heart, I'm going to get started um, with the presentation and I hope you all have fun. Um, so what we're going to cover today is um, looking at building a well-rounded um, digital brand, um, looking at archetypes and the power of storytelling. So um, since the beginning of time, storytelling has been a really critical part for us to work out how we fit in in the world, um, to give shape and meaning to our experiences, to help us understand um, what the risks are in life and the endless possibilities. We, um, when I started looking into the power of storytelling, the thing that really fascinated me was the fact that our brains are actually hardwired to think in stories. And I kind of had a bit of a moment where I went, I thought it was just me who was wandering around all day thinking in stories, but here it is, apparently we all do it, which I found really, really, really fascinating that our brains are actually hardwired to think this way in that cause and effect structure. What I found even more exciting was the fact that when you tell a story or you hear a story, the part of your brain that activates is the part like you're actually experiencing it. So if I'm watching um, a sad film, then my emotional cortex will be activated, which made sense why I am constantly crying after anything sad um, and embarrassing also crying um, when there's a sad ad on TV. So maybe my emotional cortex is in overdrive. So if I was talking to you about um, a, a beautiful meal my husband made, um, my sensory cortex would be activated and as the listener, your sensory cortex would be activated. So our brains actually would be synchronised and what that means is that storytelling affords a deeper connection. So what makes a good story? Um, there's lots of different things, but archetypes are really critical to any story. And yes, I did actually say archetypes. I didn't sneeze, clear my throat. Um, and just a reminder for those who can't stretch their brains back to second year uni, archetypes are characters that we have a universal understanding of. Um, they're present in folk tales, fairy tales, myths, and popular cultures, and they're probably best understood through example like the hero, the jester, the innocent, the ruler, the lover, the outlaw or the villain. How archetypes work is they, um, they actually give um, what's called an emotional shorthand so that you can connect with your audience through your storytelling. I really love that term, emotional shorthand. So how it works is that we all come with a universal understanding of 
the hero and his or her makeup, journey, some characteristics, or the lover or the nurturer. And we bring that understanding to a story. Um, they also enable us to, um, they also enable popularity. And I think the Game of Thrones is a really good example of this. You can see through my slides that I've got a Game of Thrones reference. And that's not just because I love Game of Thrones, but also because I think it's a great example of where people have engaged in a genre that they don't normally. And that's because of archetypes. So I've had heaps of friends who sort of say, I'm not really into that you know, sci-fi fantasy stuff. Um, and yet they love Game of Thrones. They can't get enough of it. And that's because Game of Thrones is just jam-packed with archetypes. There is many a hero, many a lover, many an outlaw or villain, many a jester, and there's a heap of people who are trying to be a ruler. And it's a great show. You're probably sitting here going, oh, this is interesting, Christina, but what has this got to do with branding? So archetypes, in the same way that they can afford an emotional connection to a story and bring popularity, they can do the same for a brand. So if you are a new brand, a new entrant, nobody knows anything about you, you're a blank piece of paper, if you actually align your brand story with an archetype, people will bring that understanding of the archetype to your brand, that universal understanding, that collective understanding. So um, I've just discovered this brand recently called Vino Mofo. I just love them. They're a wine distribution, an online wine distribution um, company. And um, they're just doing things a little bit differently by tapping into, I think, the outlaw ar archetype and the jester ar archetype. I think it's obvious in their name. You know, they've taken away some of the serious of wine drinking and um, and distributing of wine and called it Vino Mofos. And if you join up to Vino Mofos, you're a foe. And if you look at the language that they use, go and visit their website, you can see it's all about fun and enjoyment. And so they've really disrupted the market by coming in and doing it really differently. And by aligning themselves to those archetypes, we bring that knowledge about what it is to be a bit of a comedian and a bit of a rebel to their brand. Other really good examples are Nike, who um, tap into the hero archetype. The very name is the Greek goddess of victory. The swoosh represents um, the wings. Um, and if you look at their um, advertising, there's that real subliminal message about the everyday person can be a hero wearing Nike clothes. So it's all about the hero. Other examples, the Lonely Planet, um, is the explorer archetype and Lego is the creator, which makes sense. So let's have a look at archetypes a little more closely. Um, hopefully what you can see up on, on screen is the archetype wheel. Now, um, if you Google archetype wheel, you can find many a variant um, of, of a wheel. There'll be heaps and heaps of different kinds. Um, I just want to acknowledge Ness Flett, one of my colleagues who is, a, is gorgeously talented and took my scribbles of my archetype wheel and, and made it look like it looked today because I have no talent in the area of design. And so she's the, the reason behind us having something beautiful to look at today. So she, would be, um, she, would be she would definitely be the creator archetype, Lee, absolutely, um, whereas I would not. Um, so um, I probably am hanging more in the, the jester at the moment. Um, so the archetype wheel, let's have a look at that to familiarise ourselves with, with the archetype. So if you look from the outside in, you can see that there's four quadrants. There's an ego quadrant, a freedom quadrant, a social quadrant and an order quadrant. Um, it's really important to note the position of those quadrants. So the ego quadrant is opposite the social, which makes sense because in the world the individual and the social are often um, opposites. And then you've got the order quadrant with the freedom and freedom and order naturally are um, in opposing corners. So it, it makes logical sense. What's really critical is to take note of which archetypes belong to which quadrant um, and also their placement within the quadrant. So if we have a look at the freedom quadrant, you can see that the outlaw sits smack bang in the middle of the freedom quadrant. And that's because it 
represents freedom the most. It has the most freedom essence, if you like. Um, whereas to the left of it, you left of it, you've got the jester, which is on the cusp of freedom and social. And that's because any good comedian needs to be in the freedom quadrant. You need to have that freedom to be funny. But if you don't understand the social context, it's not going to work. So that's why the jester sits on the cusp of freedom and social. And if we look up at the ego, it's the same thing. The hero is smack bang in the middle of the ego, which makes logical sense. But the magician is on the cusp of ego and order because um, without having some ego, a magician can't can't perform. But without some level of order, the tricks aren't going to work. So I hope that helps you understand the, um, how it works and their relationships to each other and also to the different quadrants. What I thought might be useful is to take you through the Atworth journey um, and our, uh, the growth of our digital brand using the archetype wheel as a post-analysis tool. Um, and, um, and that will hopefully show you how the archetypes work um, in practice. So let's do that. The first, um, the first tool that we launched was very much like all organisations. We launched a website. Very typical starting point for organisations when it comes to, web, uh, to digital tools. I've coupled the website um, with the sage or the teacher in the order quadrant. And one of the reasons I've done this is because the um, a website is very much about order. The sage also sits very much on the order but on the cusp of the ego and um, a website as well as being about facts, which teachers are about, it's also a promotional tool and therefore it, it makes sense for it to be on the cusp going into the ego. If you have a look at the next slide, you'll see a screenshot of our website. And you can see the example of where everything is ordered where it should be. Like all websites, we've got a top nav, we've got a side nav, we've got level headings, we've got breadcrumbs, the logo's there quite prominently. There's a um, search function in the right hand corner where you expect it to be. And so that's that representation of order. Websites are very ordered digital tools. But how is it useful to couple it with the Sage? If I think about what makes a good teacher for me, that actually represent, represents what makes a good website. So for me, a good teacher is someone who makes the information accessible, someone who makes the information engaging and interesting and empowers my learning through interactivity, and also someone who listens. A good teacher will listen. And in the same way, a website will, a good website will have all those attributes. So a good website will be accessible, whether that's through device um, or through search or the content even being accessible through its own search, not just through a Google search. A good website will have some level of interactivity, um, calculators, forms, tools, videos, different ways of learning, as well as some form of listening tool, feedback forms, chat, whatever it might be. So moving on, we then um, developed a Twitter account and I've coupled Twitter with The Magician because I think this is a really lovely match, particularly when you look at the description of The Magician as being a charismatic leader. And in Twitter, Twitter sort of demands organisations to have and use that charismatic voice to tap into their personality more than a website would. Um, Twitter also matches the magician for us um, in that it sits in the ego quadrant and um, our Twitter account is at Itworth News, it has our name in its Twitter handle, We every tweet has our logo, um, our profile has our logo, it makes sense that it's in the ego quadrant. But more importantly, as a magician, um, Twitter is where it works best for us when we're celebrating and singing about the magical things that our doctors do. So it's where we can sing about innovation and breakthroughs and new things and visionary things. So things like our doctors who have recently used 3D printing to um, reconstruct a jaw or one of our orthopaedic surgeons who um, operated on an orangutan. 
that's where Twitter really works for us in, in singing about those magical moments. The next step in our journey was um, to launch a Facebook page and I've coupled Facebook with the hero. Um, this is very much where we are talking about and celebrating the mastery of our brand in all aspects. So that would be the building, the technology, the people, our achievements. And it's also where people post on Facebook us being the hero. Where Patients and visitors and families, you know, share how fantastic it is that we've saved someone's life or improved somebody's life or the small thing that a nurse did made a huge difference. What's really, really important to note though is that this is also where you can be the fallen hero and you need to have the courage and competency to manage that as well. Um, it's at this stage that I just want to point out that it's a really common thing to fill that top ego and a little bit of the order quadrant. Everything up there is a traditional kind of marketing approach where you're leading with the brand, you're chest feeding, it's all about the brand. Um, but I often like to think of a brand as a person and we've all got those friends who just yak about themselves all the time. They're just yada, 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 me, me, me. And, you know, you still love them as friends, but you don't want to engage with them that much. And sometimes you might avoid them. And it's the same with branding. If you've got a brand that just yaks on about itself all the time, it's not going to be very engaging. If a brand just beats its chest about itself, you're not going to actually be an authentic brand that has a good purpose um, and, and engage with your audience. And that's where it's really important to jump to the other side of the archetype wheel into where content marketing takes the lead. And this is where it can be the hero and content marketing is um, around the authenticity of information and the relevance of information and making sure there's a real generosity to share that information. And it was this, at this point in the journey that we launched our Bub Love app and our Bub Love Facebook page. And their sole purpose really was to enhance the pregnancy experience through giving information that was relevant and useful to people. So it wasn't called Etworth Bubbler. The brand really takes the back seat and it's not about test feeding about the hospital. It's actually about giving useful information. So up in the top ego quadrant you've got the Facebook page for maternity that sings about you know our food, um, parking, the hospital, our nurses, but over here on the opposite side you've got our Bob Love Facebook page that's talking about the kinds of foods you should be eating when you're pregnant or avoiding when you're pregnant um, or when you're trying to get pregnant or how to look after yourself or things to think about before you your birth plan. Really, really different. But I, I really love this social um, space, this content marketing space. I think this is where a brand can really grow and there's some real richness and um, some great opportunity. And it allows a brand to be really authentic and, and relevant in, 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 our, in our world. Um, looking further in our journey, it was um, after Bub Love that our agency who were involved in developing it, OMG Creative, came up with this gorgeous idea of Baby Mosaic um, and an Instagram connection. And basically this project was about um, inviting women and their families who had had their babies at our maternity hospital with Freemasons and inviting them to um, share their baby pictures and it was a competition where we chose one of them and then we made a giant mosaic out of all the little baby photos and we made it into a huge piece of artwork that we hung off our building on a main road, um, the Edworth Freemasons building and then we also had a digital aspect of it where you could get online and you could search your baby's name and details and find where in the mosaic they were placed. A really beautiful project and one that um, I had a fascinating experience where when we went to local council to ask them to approve the artwork for the side of the building, they said that they would approve it on the basis that we didn't include the logo. And I was really thrilled, secretly thrilled, that they had said this. Um, but everybody else was in a bit of a panic and not very happy about it, which makes sense because it's up in the ego quadrant. That's what people are used to. You, you bang your logo everywhere. Um, but 
Um, this was really, by, by matching it with the creator, this was a piece of public art. This was something that had to have that little bit of freedom. We had our logo all over our building anyway. It didn't need the logo and it needed just to be a celebration of babies. It needed just to be a beautiful um, piece of public artwork and I'm really thrilled that through the council um, requirements that it got to be that. Unfortunately, we weren't quite mature enough as an organisation in our branding journey to not include it on the digital aspect, but I think that we're, like a lot of organisations, on a bit of a journey and it's probably a little bit ironic me sharing this sort of stuff when I'm, you know, in a sea of logos behind me and it's not to say that um, logo is evil and you should never use it. It's just about working out when it's appropriate to have your logo. You know, today I'm sharing information about it worth. It's appropriate to celebrate it worth. If you're in the hero quadrant or the Twitter um, magician quadrant, you know, you can celebrate the brand and leave with it. But what it is about is getting some balance. And um, it was at this point in the journey that we um, launched Goodness Me, a wellness and health blog. Um, and I really loved this project. It was a really beautiful starting point. When, the, when we briefed the agency about Goodness Me, they came back to us with this um, beautiful, elegant, professional looking um, blog and I really loved it but it just didn't work for me and I found it really difficult to articulate what wasn't working and what I wanted and it took many, many, many words to get there. And we got there, but if I had the archetype wheel, it would have really saved me so many words because I could have been able to explain to them that what I was trying to do was couple goodness me with the every man archetype and that it needed to be down to earth, it needed to be about people and if you have a look at the next slide at the goodness me blog you can see the screenshot that the typeface has got a very human element to it. The imagery is very important about you know that everyday moment and capturing that everyday moment. That was really, really important. Um, one of the things that was interesting was to logo or not to logo this and again we weren't quite ready not to but I was really pleased that we didn't have to use a full colour corporate logo in a huge way, it got kind of a, a bottom um, reversed out, bottom corner position in the reversed out version. And when I presented this at Mayo in Oz in September, I, I joked about that, you know, in the future you might see that um, over time that logo might just kind of slowly drop off that corner and one day not be there. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that if you go to goodnessme.org.au, you might find that it is now absent. And I just cross my fingers that I don't get asked to put it on back on after this webinar. So moving forward, um, one of the most recent things that um, we have produced is a beautiful short film called A New Day and this has um, a really special place in my heart, this film, and perhaps that's why I coupled it with The Lover as you should be able to see on the archetype wheel. Um, the film, we were really lucky to have a writer and a director who understood the importance of authenticity in storytelling and telling our story and the importance of vulnerability in telling our story. Two really key aspects that the lover archetype holds. Um, and not just the vulnerability of our patient but the vulnerability of our staff and of the journey and of, of where some things end. Um, and so to me it just was a really great natural fit with the lover and when I think about what's important in a lover and I'm not thinking physical and no this isn't a pornographic film, it's um, the things that are really important is that trust and that authenticity and, and, and you are at your most vulnerable and, and that's what this captures and I'll share that film with you later um, at the end of the presentation and, and hopefully you'll see the lover come to life in, in that film. After a new day we um, developed a really fun little project, a, a music video um, based um, 
on, we were inspired by Pindara Hospital in Brisbane who had done uh, moves like Jagger, which you can find on YouTube. And we just thought that was great and a lot of fun and, and we found an opportunity to do something similar ourselves when we had to build some understanding and hype around a um, student excellence program called AIDIT. And so we couldn't resist um, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that we um, developed a, a video that um, got our executives to tap into their inner MJs and we turned aid, beat it into aid it. Um, it was so much fun and it makes sense that it would be coupled with the gesture because it really, that's what it was about. It wasn't doing anything. It wasn't about teaching people about Ada. It wasn't sitting in the sage spot. It was sitting with the jester and it was just a bit of fun as, as you can see. So looking at the, the wheel at the end um, was a really fascinating thing for me when I when I first did this. And, and the first thing that I noticed was that we had somehow managed to get a perfect mirror image on the wheel that we had covered from the first bit of order, of order into ego and all of ego and then the first bit of freedom that's opposite, you know, the, the gesture is directly opposite the sage and then all of social and so there's that perfect mirroring which gave some really nice balance and you might sort of wonder but how on earth can I as a, um, a brand be all these things at once to, to all these people? Isn't the golden rule consistency and how can I be the magician one moment and the everyman the next moment? But as I spoke earlier, I like to think of a brand as a person and if I think about myself, when I'm at work, I often in that context tap into the sage um, archetype and when I'm at home with my kids and my husband and my beautiful family I tend to tap into the caregiver and the, the lover and my husband will joke that I think I'm the ruler and when I'm with my mum and my brothers and sisters somehow I just revert into the jester um, and when I'm hanging out with friends I'm often the everyman and maybe also a little bit the caregiver so in the same way that I can um, embody different um, archetypes to suit different contexts, so can your brand to bring that well-roundedness. And I think that we're in a really exciting time when social media actually affords us to do this and, and actually encourages us to do this. So I'll now lead into um, sharing with you the um, the, a New Day, the film, which hopefully you can see how it embodies the archetype of the lover. I'll just get it up for you. It's the start of a new day. The baby is born. Person dies. A life is threatened by disease and trauma. A woman sheds a tear, fearful of the unknown. For another, it's tears of boundless joy. A surgeon calls on all his training and experience. A family waits. The big wheel of life keeps turning. This is the everyday workings of a hospital. This is the death worth. Caring for our patients. Changing people's lives for the better. Leaving pain and suffering. It will call on all the skills of our doctors and staff. And be expressed or smile. A piece of leading edge technology. Or maybe just a simple understanding that we are all people. Under the surgical gowns. Under the theatre lights. Under the blankets. Under our care. We all want to be loved and cared for. We all want to go home 
He knew he'd pay it all back to its very basics. People just want to get better. At Epworth, we strongly believe that to help achieve this goal, we must strive to improve the health, well-being and experience of every patient. Through the technology we invest in, in the innovative treatments and techniques we use, by the services we offer, and the calibre of people that we employ. For the Epworth experience to always be one of care, compassion and dignity. It's another day at Epworth. And so it goes. Until tomorrow. So there's the lover with just a hint of ego at the end. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, thanks. Christina, this is great. And uh, we're glad to have you uh, be able to, to share this with you. I just want to, uh, I, I've been commenting in the um, chat box below. If you've got questions that you'd like to ask Christina, please do uh, chime in with those and we'll get to, you know, as much as we can. One question I had with that video, how was that, uh, how was that distributed? How was that used? Is it on your website? Is it on TV? Or how is that working? Yeah, so we, um, we use it in a number of different ways. Um, predominantly, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a link from our website. We promoted it through our Facebook page. Um, but we also find our staff use it at staff forums, orientation. Um, our foundation uses it at, at donor dinners. It's got a, a wide use and open to any staff member to use it in, in any way that they see fit. And it's been a really great thing that people have really embraced. It's been fantastic. Okay. Another question uh, related to how do you, um, I want to say, so the, the archetypes that you're uh, using there, and I understand that you created this wheel or you had a creator archetype uh, person create it for you. Um, is that, uh, are, are these the sort of standard archetypes that are recognized in literature? Is that, is there, is there a canonized uh, list of, of archetypes? Um, there, there is, and, and that one is based very much on it. You will find almost the exact wheel on the internet, um, and that's really important that, that it's as uniform as possible. It just visually will look a little different. Um, it won't necessarily have all those icons. You will find that some will go beyond the 12, but I think the original um, is the 12, and some use slightly different words, so the nurturer and the caregiver the outlaw, the villain, um, but they're the standard 12, and that's the 12 that I think started and, and perhaps even started with Jung. Okay. So are there any other, uh, are there any of the archetypes that just have no business in healthcare? Um, I think um, when you, you, if you remember back to the wheel, there was the, the two areas that hadn't been filled in. It was the explorer and the outlaw, and then the innocent and the ruler. And I think the ruler is a difficult one um, for a healthcare organisation to fill because it's a really arrogant space, but that doesn't mean you couldn't fill it. You just have to do it in a really clever way. The outlaw, I think, people would really struggle with. You know, easy for Harley Davidson to um, embrace the outlaw um, archetype, but for a healthcare organisation, when um, the archetype outlaw comes with the words like radical and and the very term outlaw, and healthcare is meant to be safe, I think people would find that the most challenging. However, um, the outlaw is also about revolutionising things, is also about rebellion, is also about um, taking the world forward and going outside of the norm. And so if you take, take the right, the right. Tip, I think I you think can, can the outlaw as well. as well. Okay. All right. So um, could one kind of digital asset be applied to more than one archetype or is that... Um, is, is it really a one-to-one -one correspondence that you should be looking for there? Um, no, you could absolutely have many layers and of the wheel. You could have that initial layer that you've got and then as you produce more and more, that can continue. So the hero 
could be um, your Facebook page, but it might also be for some organisations their Instagram account and their um, Twitter account or a different kind of blog. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, absolutely not. It can be a one-to-many. It just depends on what suits you and, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I just would be worried for any brand if there was everything in the hero and I think that's a typical starting point and that's where I find the archetype wheel really useful in that you can look at it and think about well hang on if we're concentrating over here and then that's really just us talking about ourselves to people and being the hero or the ruler perhaps we need to just bring some balance and and come around to the other side it's not that scary over here with content marketing and um, and, and embrace some of that authentic, engaging content and stop talking about ourselves all the time. Okay. So, I mean, I guess the one thing, one of the big things that you emphasized was that in the more social side of the content, um, the, the, uh, the lover and the caregiver, for instance, that uh, the logo was, was de-emphasized and it sort of sounded like you would even like to get rid of it if you could. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, from my, you know, I guess just playing devil's advocate, I don't know if that's an archetype either, but, uh, but just on the, you know, the, the fact of associating your logo with this good stuff happening, with these good conversations happening also seems to be, you know, potentially the, you know, halo effect there of, of that you're encouraging this kind of stuff. Um, you know, tell me a little bit more of your thinking about uh, the de-emphasizing of the logo in that situation. So I think, I think it's really natural for us to have our feet firmly planted in that traditional top-end marketing that even when you move over to content marketing, you've still got your feet over there. You're still thinking that you've got to have your logo involved in some way and, and, and be there. But um, And it's not that you can't have your logo there at all and it's not, as I said earlier, that your logo is evil. It's just that sometimes in certain circumstances it works better not to put the logo on it and I think brands need to be brave enough to do that and um, drive authentic, relevant, generous content um, and it, I don't think it can always be authentic and generous if you're slapping your logo on just as a bit of a stamp. Sometimes it's important to have a level of authenticity but you can do that um, like in goodness me we don't have the logo on it anymore but once you get into the content it's really clear that it's about Etworth and it has pointers to the Etworth website if you want more information but we're not shoving our brand down your throat. That's that's the idea behind it. Okay. So we've got a comment from Dan here saying, really enjoyed these examples of archetypes influencing design and selection of platforms. Do your, your writer do your writers deliberately think archetype when they create content for the various platforms? Yeah, so this is um, for us a, a, a starting point where I've actually used it as a, a post analysis tool, but now we're going to start using it as a development tool. And it's going to make conversations much, much easier to be able to find our writers. So absolutely, yes, that um, our writers would be thinking that this is the every man archetype and that's what goodness me should be representing. We're already having these conversations with our writers without using the term archetype and without saying every man and we're just using more words. We're saying, you know, I want this to be not the corporate speak, I want it to be really engaging and have that down to earth language. So we're already talking in that. What the archetype wheel affords us is to be able to really succinctly determine and define what it is we're after. We want it to be the, the everyman archetype. Well, what is the everyman archetype? It's this. And and that's really great to be able to brief your writers. So, yes, it will be a really useful tool for that. Excellent. How would you uh, use the archetype uh, structure outside of digital branding in a healthcare context? Yeah, I think that... Um, I applied it to our digital branding, but I think you could equally apply it to your advertising, to your communications and publications, to your internal comms, um, to your traditional print, radio. You could actually apply it to each of those as well um, and think about which um, platform might suit, which traditional 
advertising platform might suit? Where are you being the hero? Where are you being the magician? Um, and is everything sitting in the hero and is that appropriate? So I think you could absolutely mirror what I've done with Edward's digital journey on the um, more traditional marketing areas as well. So we got somebody else here asking, will the slides be posted and particularly the brand, the archetype wheel uh, for reference later, or are they going to have to pause the, the, the video? <laughs> um, absolutely. I'm a big believer in, in, in sharing your ideas. Um, I think as I said to Margaret in an earlier email, there's no point in having it under your bed where nobody can steal stuff. You know, I think a good idea is a, an idea shared and, and it should be available to everyone. Um, so yes, the slides will be available so that people can actually see the wheel and take some time to understand it um, and, um, and learn to use it. And I'd be more than happy for people to contact me on Twitter with any questions they've got around it um, at um, on my Twitter handle, that would be really easy. Yeah, that'd be great and we'd really encourage people to continue uh, the conversation here as well. Um, this will be part of a discussion thread that's uh, part on, uh, on the Mayo Clinic social media network site. So uh, Christina will be generally probably like uh, 18 hours be ahead of us, I guess. So, I mean, if you if you post a question today, for the most part, it'll be tomorrow, I suppose, before she sees it. Um, in fact, it is tomorrow there now, right? But uh, uh, so another question here asking about your team. Um, you know, how many people do you, how are you structured and how many people do you have working on social media with Epworth? Sure. Um, for the bulk of the work that we did, it was just me and an agency. Um, it wasn't until we got to um, Baby Mozak and Goodness Me that um, I had one staff member um, for social and then I got someone to help me with the web. Um, and now I have um, a social person, a web and a couple of marketing experts. So we're still very light on the ground, particularly in the digital side, but we're really blessed to have some great partners. Um, but I think it's a, a really... Um, the, our journey is one that I think that if you put your mind to it and you um, and if you you just are really determined to do it, you can make it happen. Um, often people get really overwhelmed about social and where to start. And the best advice I can give around that is start where it's logical. We started um, around maternity because women um, who were pregnant were uh, a natural audience who were already using social media and they were hungry for it and they wanted engagement and so we, we went there. Um, rather than just having a Facebook page for Facebook sake um, and we then launched a general Facebook page m many um, months, even I think a year later. So we really just had that um, that solid maternity Facebook page and it's really important to make sure that what you're going out with is relevant to your audience and you're not just doing it because everybody else has got one. Very good. I think this gets us to the, um, I'm going to just give it one more check. Oh, so uh, a couple more. Uh, actually, there were a couple more. So how do uh, archetypes relate to identifying personas in content marketing? Um, so um, archetypes and, and personas in content marketing. Well, I probably see archetypes and personas as the same, um, you know, just another term for it. Um, I suppose in content marketing what you, you could do is you could look at um, different articles, um, tapping into the different archetypes, so you could take the wheel outside of platform base and apply it to a, a platform in itself and take it down to the next granular level. I'm not sure that that actually answers the question. Yeah, I mean, actually, as I'm thinking about it, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really interesting observation that, you know, I would think that the archetypes are more oriented toward the brand and who you are and the personas are more toward your audience, you know, so it's thinking of who is that person that I'm writing for and what's their situation like. You know, so it's maybe being the oh, okay. So I'm so we're going to get really meta here. Uh, that uh, you know, if you're talking, uh, it's it's in that social quadrant down there. So I'm not which no don't know which of the three it would be, but it's when you're thinking personas, you're actually being one of those things in the lower quadrant. That's you know, audience focused versus ego focused versus organization focused. 
Oh, and now I feel really silly and, and I'll use the um, early morning as an excuse. Okay, so I now understand the question more fully. Um, and I think that is a really great question and really, really interesting and something I hadn't actually thought of, which is why I love doing this because, um, you know, different people's interpretations can open, often open up different ways of thinking. And absolutely, I think you could apply the archetypes to your audience personas. Absolutely. So you could... Um, really look at um, your audience and say, are we dealing with a, a hero audience? Are we dealing with a um, everyman audience? Are we dealing with a jester audience? And then, based on that, match the your your tool to it. Absolutely, I think there would be a really nice synchronicity. I can't even talk now. There would be a nice connection there. Right. Well, and so Lisa Ramshaw is also chiming in to say hi with a fun fact that you're one of the co-authors of the Twitter book, book Don't Be an Egghead, that uh, many of our members uh, here have copies uh, of. And so also the fact that you're part of the planning uh, committee for uh, Mayo and Oz 2016, which oh, yeah. is coming up in the middle of November in uh, in Melbourne. So we'll, uh, we'll trust you to show us around uh, to some of the good places that we should see. I'm but really that, excited about that. That's yeah. great. Yeah, and we're, we're, yeah. Okay. Right. So it's kind of uh, kind of amazing that uh, you and Lisa are connecting through uh, Minnesota here. So I'll agree with that. Thanks again, uh, Christina. We're really so glad that you could share this, and this gives us some things to think about as we're looking at where our various uh, platforms fit along the archetype wheel, and that we make sure that we're not uh, way out of balance and. Uh, so I think that uh, it, it is neat to see how you've sort of after the fact gone back and mapped it and said, hey, okay, there's a reason why maybe it seemed to fit that we would do something like this because we were a little out of, you know, out of uh, emotional balance, so to speak. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I hope everybody got and, something out. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sure we did, and we had a had a good group staying uh, most of the way through the through the uh, broadcast. Uh, so with that, we uh, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, everybody, who has been part of this. Uh, let's please do continue the conversation uh, in the in the network site. We look forward to that. Uh, the next webinar, I believe, we'll be, have scheduled for February 18th. Um, that'll be February 19th for you over there, Christina, and probably more like 3 a.m., I suppose. But uh, you can watch the archive anyway. Um, and maybe we'll see about getting some more uh, Australian presenters who can... Um, you know, so that for our members who are over there, they'll be able to watch during uh, their own daytime. Thanks, everyone. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.